Welcome to another leadership podcast from the team here at C3 Southwest Washington. To find out more about our church, visit c3swwa.com. It's good to be in God's house. Let me just real quick before you're seated, um, let me just remind you that we're in a series entitled uh, Intentionally, Intentionally Us. And uh, this series is what we are as a church family. What, we're, what are our main ingredients that make up us? And tonight we're going to be on uh, number eight. And as we take a look at that, um, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 through 11. Check this out. It says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. And you will be enriched in every way. In every way, I love this, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And so tonight I want to talk to you along the idea, the topic of generosity is our response. And these words are chosen very, very specifically. As a church family, generosity is part of our character and it is our response. Amen. And every time I use the word generosity, I want you to equate it with more than enough. You cannot be generous if you do not have enough. But when you have more than enough, you are able to take from the more than enough and share it with others. Generous is our response. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you will uh, help to reinforce this, not only in our church family, our lives, but Lord, as this is one of our value systems that we can demonstrate it as we have in the past as a church and as it can become a part of the fragrance of the room that when people walk in, the generosity becomes a part of who they are as they experience you, Lord. And so we pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Um, every time that you're in this room, and tonight um, we have a number of families who are at home who are uh, dealing with pre-COVID, mid-COVID, post-COVID. I, I just want to call it the flu moving on forward, okay, so that we have, it's the flu. And uh, I don't want to demean it, and, but I also don't want to inflate it beyond what it is. We hate that uh, people are sick. If you're sick, stay home. But otherwise, be here. Okay, if you get an t- elbow ache, well, don't worry, I won't catch that. Um, go ahead and come anyways. But if you know, you're sick, stay home. We want you to be confident with that, have permission to do that, and we support you in that. And get online and be a part of, of what's going on. Okay, looking at this portion of scripture, oh, what I was going to say is, uh, anytime you see that symbol with our, um, with our wrench and our, our wheel during the season, our pre-launch season, we're just getting geared up to get relaunched out in the community. We're meeting on Saturday nights. We thank God for this borrowed building. We've been reassembling our teams. We've been adding new people to the group. We've been moving people around. A night like tonight, we get a bunch of phone calls. Hey, I can't be there. We're moving people all, you know, it's like playing some kind of game. We're moving the pieces around. And you guys all have such a great attitude in doing that. Behind the scenes, we're also working on the building. They have really ramped it up this week, okay? Um, I said, told you last week that the sign is up uh, on both sides of the building. So drive down uh, 500 and notice it all lit up at night or during the day. It's nice and dark. We're on the front of the building. They started framing and finished it up really this week. That's an old picture from last week. Plumbers have been in there. They got it all plumbed out. Electri- electrician starts on Tuesday. He'll spend two weeks and he'll be done. Okay, so then there's drywall, there's, there's other things to still do. Really shooting for an early March move-in date, but listen, you know, don't, don't, don't bet on that horse, okay? Bet on February, okay? <laughs> so, um, as, so with that, uh, just thank you for your patience with that, and let's take a look at this portion of Scripture. Um, 2 Corinthians, in this portion of Scripture, it's a, por- it's a, a beautiful piece that's nestled in a dialogue between Paul and the church at Corinth about an offering that they were going to receive. And it's kind of like our vision builders offering. We talk about that every year. It's what is our what is our initiative for this year, the great thing that we want to do. And over the last several years, we've done vision builders. Um, We've given a large portion of it to our, our facilities fund, which enables us to do this build out. But we also designate a large portion of the vision builders to things like church planting. We have helped uh, churches in Tex- uh, Texas, Pastor Kerry. We've helped this last year, Pastor Seth and Karen, to purchase a building. We we handed them twelve grand. We gave um, how much? Twenty five thousand dollars to Hope City. I think that was the amount. Trish, is that what it was? I mean, our church has done some significant things. We supported our missionaries. 
down in Oaxaca this year. We have uh, sent money for the children at, at Trigo y Miel. I think it was close to $8,000 this last winter. And so this scripture is kind of in the context of talking about the Vision Builders offering for this particular church, but they hadn't received it yet. They had advertised it. We're going to receive it. But it becomes a great venue for the Apostle Paul to talk about ideas of being generous. And I grabbed onto this scripture because it's just so profound. And as you look at these verses, let me just give you a couple of things that I think are worthy of your attention as you look at these verses. First of all, um, you discover that in these verses, you and I, we are all, we're like farmers. We are people, our lives are like farms. There is a uh, a field before us, and we want to use our lives to accomplish things. Number one, we have our basic needs, which is our bread. And you see, as a farmer, you need, you need to be able to eat, and yet you're investing some of your resources to create a more than just the basics of what you need. You need the bread to eat to survive, but you're sowing the seed into the ground to create something more. And so you are that farmer in this portion of Scripture. But as you start out, you don't have any bread and you don't have any seed. You need the seed to make bread. You need the bread to eat, but you don't have either. And so in this portion of Scripture, God introduces himself as your source. And man, I get, I'm sorry if you're not excited. I'm just going to be excited by myself. I'll dance a little jig up here for a few minutes and we can go home. But God reveals himself as our source. Now, we might get our bread, we might get our seed through other conduits, but God is saying to his people, I am still your source. And so he reveals, I'm going to provide your bread in this, these verses. In other words, I'm going to meet your basic needs. And so many people have limited God to that context. Well, God's not obligated to do anything beyond that. I mean, he said he'll supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And while that is true, it's only partially true because he goes on to say, not only will I supply your bread, but I'm going to provide for the seed that you can sow into the ground. God is going to supply the bread, your basic needs. God is going to multiply, he says, the seed for sowing. And I say it like this, bread is for your needs, seed is for your more than enough. Bread is for just barely enough. Seed is to create more than enough. And the scripture goes on to say that God is going to multiply that seed. And why is he going to multiply the seed? The Bible says there to increase your harvest of righteousness. Bottom line, when you really kind of parse this all out, you get this idea that God is wanting to push more into your life in all fashions, not just money. The seed represents joy, friendships, relationships, opportunities at work, business opportunities, friendships, great moments in life, opportunities to serve incredibly, that all turns into your harvest of righteousness. It's basically thriving in life. You'll hear us use that word all the time, thriving. There's survival, and then there's what we call thrival. The heart of God is not just for your survival. He doesn't want just enough. He wants you to thrive, amen? amen. Okay, shake the person next to you. Say, wake up, you need to thrive. Start thriving right now. You are thriving, act like it. If you need to go an elbow a little higher, go ahead and feel free to do that and tell them God bless you as you do. Now, what, what's the result of God giving you that extra uh, multiplied seed? Ultimately, you will be, get ready for this word. This will rub some people the wrong way. The word there is you will be enriched. I'm just telling you, it means to be made rich. You know what that means? Uh, you parse that down to the original Greek. It means that your life will be flowing and abounding. The root word actually is there is the picture of sailing. Your life should look like a, God's heart is for your life to look like a sailboat with a force outside of you pushing you through life. That's the picture of being enriched. That it, uh, just enough is that the boat stays buoyant and doesn't sink, but enriched is that you're being propelled along by the goodness of God's favor to move you to the good destinations of life. That's the picture that God is painting of you. Amen? Some of you are like, well, I don't deserve that. I know you don't deserve that. 
You don't even deserve to be in the water. You should be hung up on the rack someplace with the rest of us. But God has said, no, no, no. I want to bless your life. I want you to thrive. Not only are you going to be in the water and be able to be stable, but I'm going to get behind your sail and push you through your life. And if you're as young as I am, that's a lot of life ahead. So you get really excited. Those of you who are older, I mean, maybe it's not as exciting, but for me, it's very, very exciting. Okay? Enriched how? The Bible says in every way. Don't buy into this. This is about just money. Now, it is about money. It is about resources, but it's about health. It's about opportunities. It's about good, full, thrive of life. Anything that attaches itself to your life falls into the category of things that God wants to enrich. Well, I'm not really sure he wants to enrich my, my, uh, my hobbies. I, th- I think he does. I think he cares about that. Well, none of the disciples had hobbies. We see a three-year window of their life. I promise you that there's more to living than just that. Okay, God wants to enrich your life in every way. Why? The scripture goes on to say, so that if God is generous to you, what can happen? So that you can then turn around and be generous to others. You can't be generous if you only have just enough, but God is committing to doing more than enough for you so that you will have more than enough so that you can turn around and out of that more than enough, be generous. Why? The end result is that everyone is thankful And then the attention for this great enriching in their lives is then directed at God, and he is then revealed to be the one who can also enrich their lives as well. I've kind of put it this way on this slide, and and this is kind of a run-on sentence, but brace yourself. God will be your generous source so that you can thrive and be generous, exposing others to the promise that God will be their generous source so they can thrive and be generous, exposing others to the promise that God will be their generous source, and so on and so on and so on. You know, we had a couple, many of you know that we have an Airbnb in our house, and early in the pandemic, there were a lot of people moving around using Airbnbs to decide, now that I can work remotely, where do I want to live? And we had this younger couple that had booked four different Airbnbs for a month at a time, and, they're, they, and they were all over the country, and so they moved over here, and they were going to check it out, and do we want to live life here, and they were in their early 20s, and uh, I think we were, were the second stop, and uh, they, they enjoyed it so much, they stayed for an extra month, and that was just crazy good, but they're one of the few people that wanted to know, could we come upstairs, and could we meet you, because most people, they pull in, they wave, and it's, it's not weird at all, you know, you're just like a host, and this couple was like, we'd love to come up, and we want to bring you something to eat, and I think they brought a bottle of wine, and they wanted to talk. And so they were very, like, goal-oriented, and they began to ask what we do and kind of some stuff like that. And we got talking about the Airbnb and rental properties and my background a little bit with some of, some of the real estate stuff I've done. And she's like, okay, so how did you get to that place? How did you find yourself in this situation? Oh, yeah, let's go. Do you really want to hear this story? And so I began to share that my very first house I bought, we, we, we tried to buy when we were 29, and we didn't have the credit to be able to purchase the house, so we got involved with the sweat equity program. And in building the house over a year, doing all this work, I didn't know how to build anything. I spent a year building the house, and a week after we moved into the house, all of a sudden a landslide a mile away starts and doesn't hurt our house, but kills our house's value. We could never sell it. People are moving out of their houses. They're running away because, you know, the sky is falling like it always is even to this day. And in the process... God, we prayed, God did us a miracle, and we ended up keeping that house and renting it out and moving into another house and living in an even nicer house. And through the tragedy that we were experiencing, calling out on God, God can make your worst day into your best day. In fact, I promise you that sometimes your worst moment becomes the springboard into the very best of your life. I, you mark it down. The worst moment, your worst failure can be redeemed by God to become the greatest thing ever. And so I began to share that we prayed, and the night that I stood up and prophesied, and Rowena remembers it differently than me, but her memory's terrible, and mine's spot on all the time. And so I rose up and prophesied over my house, and the chains of hell snapped, and there's a shaking, and earthquakes opened, and, and so God did all these great things. And I began to lay it out and understand that the, the, the hero of my story is not me and my geniusness, because that would not be factual. But it was the heroness of God and what he has done for my family. And I watched this girl begin to cry. The tears are coming down her eyes. 
And she reveals to us that she had grown up in church and had walked away from God. And so it created a great moment. God was my source. Yes, I worked hard and there were things that I did, but God was my source. And vocally, I celebrated to her that God was my source. And I didn't draw attention to this great property that we have. She could already see that. But who is standing behind the great property? God. And in that moment, you could just see it in her eyes. Ah, maybe you could be my source too. And I don't know how it's turned out. I don't, I, we talked for a while and we were, got to be friends, but they've moved on. It's been two years now. But that was a part of the discussion in her life that came through us. And so this really rings out true. God wants to be your generous source so that you can thrive. And as you thrive, that you can be generous, which then exposes others to the promise that God will be their generous source. And so they can thrive and be generous, exposing others to the promise that God will be their generous source so they can, and you know, dot, 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 dot. If you're generous, this is how things will flow through your life. If you can understand that God is our, your source and that he is going to be generous. So a couple of points for you tonight in the remaining time that I have. Number one, God is our source. And it's so important. I'm going to say the second part. And he is generous. And this might take a shift for you to get into. In fact, you might even be able to say amen or amen or Woman, or however you personally do it, you know, feel free to, to use your own way about that. And we won't judge you at all. <laughs> at all. Um, but God, God is your source, and you need to see him as generous. Because your posture in dealing with God will affect how he's able to interact with you. For years and years and years, I bought into this philosophy that I heard in the church world around me that it would be wrong to have anything extra. It would be wrong to, to ask God for something you want. You should only ask God for the things that you desperately need and be thankful for what you have and just be satisfied there because anything above and beyond that certainly doesn't fit into scriptural concepts. And yet, when you begin to look in the scripture, you begin to discover God is generous. I don't know about you, but how I used to pray, I prayed, oh, God, please, 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 God, please, God, please, God, please, God, please if you're willing. I, God, I, I, and I'm trying to validate to God how real my need is because what I picture is God squeezing onto his supply, and I've got to somehow convince him or pry out of his stingy fingers the thing that I need. But the reality is that is not the God of Scripture. That's not the God of the Bible. In fact, just a couple of, 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 of statements to make to you that, that this idea of less than enough is not God's design. It's not part of his original plan. It's not going to take place in heaven. It is the design of the wicked one. It is the byproduct of sin. God does not withhold. God is not stingy. God is a God of more than enough, as you read in Scripture. A couple of examples. Exodus 3, verse 8, the, the uh, people of God, the Israelites, were in bondage. And of course, that's not enough. It's less than enough. God wasn't pleased with it. So God wanted to lead them to a place of more than enough. In fact, as he describes the place that he's going to give them, he talks about it being, you know, we're going to release you from the hand of the Egyptians. We're going to bring you out of that land to a good land. That should be enough, right? But the description goes on to say this, not just a good land, but a broad land. No, 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 Lord. I don't deserve that. Just give, me a, just give me a little swatch of, a little patch of grass where I can just kneel down and be thankful. No, I'm going to give you a good and broad land. And he goes on to say, it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. I don't know how much milk you need. I don't know how much honey you need, but I don't need the spigot to flow. And yet God is saying through this description, I want to bless you. I don't, I, I, I'm glad to provide your needs, but I want it for my people to be more than enough. That's not my desire for me. That's God's desire for me. Scripturally, look at John chapter 2, verse 6, and it talks about the first miracle that Jesus did. Fascinating. There were a couple that was getting married, and how many of you know somebody who's less than administrative who tried to pull off something administrative, and you're all standing there and supposed to eat something, and there's a couple of Twix and, you know, maybe an old bag of potato chips, and there's 45 people in the room. You're all looking around at whoever was supposed to order, and in this case, 
the groom was in charge of the wine. Halfway through the wedding, they run out of wine. This is the first miracle that Jesus does. Now, if you are like me, I'd be like, you know what? Serves him right. The guy needs to get his day timer in order and get stuff ordered and stop messing around all the time and have his plan and execute it. And, you know, do you feel like that sometimes? Is it just me? And then so when things fall apart, serves him right. And yet Jesus steps in on the scene and there's this need for wine. And it's a couple's special event. And his mom is moved by that and he responds, not in a, this is not a need. You, you hear me? It wasn't going to be the end of the world if they ran out of wine. They'd be making fun of him for a long time. Yeah, yeah, moron. Remember when you got married and ran out of wine? Here's the pictures. Here's the beginning of the wedding. And here's the end of the wedding. Everybody angry. Where's the wine? And so Jesus steps in on the scene and he does something crazy. He asks for them to grab the six water jars. Each water jar held 30 gallons of water. And he turns that into wine. So let me do a little math for you here real quick. Six jars turns into 180 gallons of wine, which is 681,000 milliliters of wine, 950 milliliters to a bottle. That is 717 bottles of wine. Okay, let's do this. And when they bring the wine to the guy who is in charge of all the banquets, who's been at a lot of weddings, he has established a lot of weddings. He knows the cheap wine. He knows the middle of the road wine. And he knows the fine wine because this guy runs the banquets, okay? And when he tastes this wine, he says, whoa, most people serve the decent wine at the beginning and use the garbage at the end so that no one will notice but you've brought out the finest of wine at the end. So just a little math for you. Certainly, you know, this 717 bottles at, at a cheap wine, $10 a bottle from Rosauer's, do the math on $7,000 worth of wine. There's no way that this wedding was the size to need that. And it wasn't like, hey, give everybody 30 bottles. But what he was doing is he was fixing the shortage, the not enough at the wedding and saying, not only am I going to give you enough for the wedding, but I'm going to give you enough wine so that you can maybe return you know, to the vendor or so that you can sell in the market. And I'm going to give you 7000 You probably only need $2,500 worth of cheap wine. Remember, this ain't cheap wine. But if it was cheap wine, I'm going to... I'm going to give you more than enough. I don't know about you, but in today's economy, you start calculating it out. A decent bottle of wine, I mean like a good bottle of wine, would be $71,000 worth of wine that Jesus gave them. But if you're really looking at some of the finest wines, and this is not even top. I was at a restaurant recently. They brought out the wine list. I was with some people, and all of the bottles of wine, trust me, we did not have one of these, were $500 a pop. And I was like, I have... I can't imagine. Is it like gold and like gets on my tongue and I'm like, you know, 16, I don't, I've never had a, you know, and, and, and someday, let me look you in the eye, maybe I will have a $500 bottle of wine and I'll let you know, or maybe you already know, you can tell me now. And, and if there comes to that moment, that's not my everyday world, okay? But if it was a $250 bottle, well, by, that way, by the way, I had half a glass of, I think it was, they bought a $90 bottle of wine and it was couldn't tell the difference, honestly, between a $10 bottle of wine. But if it was a $250 bottle of wine, which would be a real fancy bottle of wine, Jesus gave them $179,000 worth of product. At a wedding for a dummy groom who didn't do his job. You know why? Because he wanted that couple just to, it's her wedding day. Man, if I was a dad and I blew it like that and Jesus shows up and makes up for my not enough and turns it into more than enough, people are praising this group. Oh, man, that dude brought out $250 bottles of wine. I took an extra one home. And that groom was able to sell it and do something honorable for his bride. The heart of God is for more than enough in your life. You need to understand that because when you approach God humbly but knowing he probably wants to do more than you're asking. It'll help you to approach your heavenly father, a generous father in an appropriate way that allows you to receive whatever he has. You know, just one more example, Matthew chapter 14. 
Remember when that entire crowd didn't have enough food and they took the boys' lunch? Jesus broke the bread, prayed over it. The Bible says he blessed it. They served approximately, when you look at it, over 10,000 people. They went and they collected all of the remaining baskets of bread and fish. Now, I don't know. I don't imagine it's a little tiny basket. Oh, let's go around and pick up the... I'm imagining back then, you know, marketing baskets. Them filling that up with fish. It's not just extra provision. Jesus didn't just feed the crowd, but he provided more than enough. That, that more than enough, it went somewhere. It went to somebody. It blessed people. And God is, you can see his heart revealed in this. Everything in our culture and sometimes in the church paints the picture of God being stingy and really not wanting to do his best for his people. But that is not scripture. Generosity is who God is, and then generosity needs to be our response. Um, Way back in the beginning of 2019, at the beginning of our gatherings, I would stand up and I would invite everyone in our church family to read this declaration with me. That lasted for about three months. And as you know, there was a thing that began to happen, and I don't know that we all can quite put our finger on what was that anyways. But it was very intrusive. And I stopped saying that. And we all went through various things. And some of you in your businesses or in your families or in your health or in your career or whatever it was, we are all navigating our way. And I keep finding this on a slide someplace and keep wanting to bring it out. And I got a feeling that when we get into the new building, I'm just going to paint it on the on the, I was going to say the freaking wall, but that'd be inappropriate. <laughs> so I won't say that. <laughs> but I just want to be there to be reminded because, again, hear me for a second. We're not talking about money. Trisha, you get, you're dreaming about a future business you guys are going to launch. I mean, some of that's in the works, and that's terrifying. <laughs> it's hundreds of thousands of dollars invested, and no guarantees. But there's a partnership with God. And I know who I'm grabbing onto if I know him as the God who is generous. Now, the problem is, all the whispers in my head all day long when I listen to the news, when I listen to social media, sometimes when I listen to myself, I get a picture that God is less than generous. So we have declarations like the Declaration of Independence to remind ourselves and to inform the enemies who speak otherwise where we stand. And so we used to read this. We used to together say, today, here and now, I declare that God has more right now in my life. And I'm, I'm blessed, but God has more. I make that declaration right now. I declare it to myself. I declare it to the enemy who is saying otherwise. I declare it to you so that it'll stir your faith. I declare it to the world. God has more. More for me, more for you, more for us, more through us for them. And I refuse to wait for more to simply show up. Instead, I'm going to stretch for the more that God has for me. And my stretch is the catalyst that unlocks the more that he has. As I do my part, God will miraculously do his. I am stretching for more because that is who God is. God is is the God of more. Amen? Amen? Amen. And that needs to be a part of your declaration. When you look at your kids, when you look at their future, when you get the prognosis, you're going to get the prognosis in life of less. It's going to happen a lot. It's going to come from the doctor. It's going to come from the bank. It's going to come from your boss. It's going to come from the people who don't call you back. It's going to come at times from people who are saying, we wanted to sign the contracts, but it ain't happened. Less is going to be the prognosis many times, and you're going to need to stand up and say, that's not true. God is the God of more. And you're going to need to remind yourself and remind your spouse and remind your kids and remind the storm and remind your situation, and you're going to need to throw some punches and pray in the Spirit and maybe speak in tongues and kick, you know, some make-believe people. Well, if you find a real one who needs it, anyways, that's probably not anointed from God. For those of you at home, it's kind of a joke. Okay, Uh, and again, I'm not talking only about money or financial resources. You hearing me? Because God doesn't just supply you with financial seed. He supplied you with forgiveness seed. 
Jesus came, his son, and like shed his blood. That's, that's amazing. The blood of a bull is terrifying enough. If, if, you re, if you had to do in the Old Testament, like they did, they would pin a, pin a bull down on the ground, and you, the sinner, would have to take a knife and slit the bull's neck. And you would have to watch the blood pour out of that animal and die, knowing that that blood was in your stead. Now, I've done some hunting. I have no problem with it and eaten everything that I've ever hunted for. But I'm going to tell you what, just going up to an animal and slitting its throat so that my sin could be forgiven, I don't know. That would be tough. That would be sad. And when you understand that is what happened to Jesus on your behalf, the generosity, it, his life wasn't taken. He offered it. That is how God, and generous God is. You come after one of my kids, and you're going to have to go through me first. Well, you probably have to go through Rowena first. She is not the one you want to even have to deal with. Go through me first, okay? I'll get knocked out of the way. Her, that's going to be like tangling with a, a rabid squirrel. You going down, it's going to happen, you know? Um, but the father just willingly offered his son. They're like, I want to see that. Well, I've seen it a couple times. It's just... It's a flash. It's a look. You can see it. It's terrifying. So I step back. I could get off track here. I could tell you a couple of stories that are hilarious. Um, forgiveness, blessing. You know, God is an encourager, and we need to be generous encouragers. God is generous to give praise for the good things in our life, even when we've got some bad things. And so he wants to be, us to be generous, to do the same to others. And the list could just time, help, encouragement, all of those things. Now, let me give you point number two. Generosity is our response. And again, that's to his generosity. It's so key. You don't give to get. You give because you've gotten. But the giving because you've gotten lubricates the future to allow the giving process to continue in your life. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9.11 says, you will be enriched in every way. That's first, to be generous in every way. And so we are generous because he is generous. I'm going to skip point three, but I'll just read it to you really quick. Tithing actually isn't a form of generosity. Many of you tithe. We thank you. It puts bread in the house, but it's part of your covenant. One of the great dangers for people who tithe, who are legalistic tithers, is to say, I've been generous, now I can go and do what I want. And that's not generosity. Uh, I'll, let me just say this really quick. If I made a deal with you that I am going to give you $10, Val, every week, and you can bank on it. Now, I'm going to give it to you through a bunch of different people, but when I give you the $10, it's me supplying. You're going to have to show up maybe and you know, work at the gym, or you might have to go work cutting some lawns, or you might have to tutor a student, or you might have to, you know, babysit, okay? But I'm going to get you the 10. Now, I promise you it's coming from me, but in our agreement so that you recognize that it's coming through me, because I'm not going to give it to you. It's going to come through other people. I just simply want you to give me one back. It's mine. And so when you return the one of the 10 to me, it is your, your nod that I recognize you as source, and I'm going to continue this cycle of generosity. In fact, because you buy into this whole idea of me giving to meet your needs and you honoring me as the giver with the one-tenth, I'm going to, I'm going to exponentially bless the next cycles that are coming. That's not generosity. If I loan you my car and you give me the keys back, and begin to dance, I gave a car. No, I, I, I gave you the car, and you gave me my keys back. You're just returning what is rightfully mine. When you return your tithe to the Lord, you are just buying into that uh, beautiful covenant that he has set up actually before the law, before Moses, that dates back to, right back to the first sons of Adam and Eve. And you'll discover that the issue there was an unwillingness to participate in the covenant. Anyway, so, because I just don't want, what I'd hate for you to think is, look, I gave God my 10%, so now I don't have to give anybody anything. I don't have, I, I serve at church, and that's, that's enough. 
you'd actually be robbing yourself of the true generosity, what you do with what is remaining. That's your generosity. That's where life gets really exciting. Okay, uh, number 12. Are you okay with the final point? Thanks, Rowena. I'm going to, you seem so excited. I got a couple more points I'm going to share with you when we get home. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for believing in me. Uh, stand with me and I'll, I'll finish this one with you. Okay. Generosity guarantees an abundant return. It guarantees. It's, it's the promise of God. You know, when the, the Bible says that God, um, the word of God does not return void. In other words, God sends out his word. Um, it, is, it is shown in scripture like seed. And within the seed of God's promise, whatever he's promised to do, in that promise is everything necessary for the fulfillment of the promise to take place. It's interesting, I was listening to a, some dialogue uh, this week about some seed that they have uncovered some time back. Out of all places, the pyramids of Egypt. Seed that was thousands of years old that they planted into soil and it blossomed. If God makes a promise and you will take his promise and you will plant it into the soil of your heart, it cannot help but grow into the thing that it says it will grow. When God's word here in, in Luke chapter six, verse 37 and 38 is, is speaking, it is speaking about God's provision and about the fact when you give, you'll receive. But notice the words that are in this portion of scripture. It's not just about money, okay? This is the beautiful, this is the really the great final point for you. It says, judge not and you will not be judged. You know, when, you, you know, doesn't mean you can't make a, a, a measurement of what's going on. Oh, I can't judge them. Uh, you just watch them steal something from somebody. I think, I don't think that's the judging we're talking about here. You can measure somebody's behavior and be like, no, 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 that's inappropriate. Who are you to judge me? I don't know. I'm, I'm a human being. I'm, I'm your mother. <laughs> I will judge you all day long and you're guilty. How dare you judge me? Well, I just listened to you lie to somebody. Now, when it says judge not, it's talking about the way you address that person is going to be the way they're going to judge you. So in other words, when you deal with somebody, deal with them lovingly, deal with them honestly, so that when you are judged, because you're going to screw up later on, you are going to be judged accordingly. And you're going to be wrong sometimes, but you want to be... She's got to take the final point, that girl. She's so cute. Uh, it goes on to say... Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Forgive and what? It will be forgiven. When you say, I forgive you, you open the door to be forgiven. It's, it's the promise of return, right? And here's the words that you love and I love, but it goes on to say, give and it will be given to you. These are all examples of giving. When you give, it will be given to you. In other words, when you are generous, it will come back upon you a good measure. You know what a good measure is? When I pay $1 and I get $2 in return, that's good measure. When I blessed somebody and I had five people bless me in return. When I met a need in $1,000 and God gave me the opportunity to, to invest in something that returned to me $20,000. That's the good measure. It's good measure, it means it's in your favor. So it says, give and it will be given to you. I gave, ultimately God gave to me first, I turned around and gave and was generous because he was generous to me. And then it says it will return back to you good measure, so good measure, it's going to be stuffed down in the box. Not like a $17 bag of potato chips that has $4 worth of shards in the bottom, but a bag of potato chips where it's shoved down in there when you pop it open like popcorn, it's popping out. It's overflowing, running over into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. We are generous because he was generous to us first, but generous is our response. You know, last year wasn't one of our biggest giving year, receiving year as a church family, but it was our biggest giving year that we've ever had. You know why? Because in a time of, 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 of enough, 
but not huge margins, we said, you know what? Give and it will be given to you. We gave probably 25% of our income out last year. And we don't do that every year, but we did that last year. Why? Because we could, because we wanted to bless, we wanted to be generous because God had been so generous to us. So I just want, can I, can I pray over you? We're gonna sing this final song. I went a little bit longer by four minutes, but you'll forgive me, right? It's okay, Shane? Okay, so if they come after me, you're gonna block, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> don't worry. I'll let, let Raina take care of it. She's got it in good hands, right? I'm gonna pray over you. I pray that if you're struggling with generosity, that God will turn your eye onto the fact that anything and everything you have right now or ever have received, he has been your source. And if you will see him as source, your heart will change immediately. So I'm gonna pray that. Father, I just speak out over your people, the people who are at home. Father, maybe people in the room who are becoming your people. And Father, before they were ever living and before their first sin or their thousandth or worst day, your generosity in the form of your son was given wholly and generously to their lives so that they could be blessed in every way, not just make it to heaven, not just be forgiven, but struggle through life, but so that they could experience abundant life in every way. And so, Father, I pray that you will open their eyes to see the generous God, to see a future that can be richly blessed in every way. To, Father, to look at what comes into their life as your provision because you are the source. And, Lord, I'm confident as they see you as source, they will be able to step into that abundance that you have, enjoying of all of your provision. And I pray, Lord, that they will begin to discover steps of being generous, stepping into helping someone, stepping into giving in a way they've never given before, stepping into investing maybe in one of our students going to Panama or, or going to Mexico this summer, maybe stepping into our upcoming Vision Builders offering, maybe stepping into a coworker's life who's really struggling at work because of maybe illness. And they step in and help make a mortgage payment, something big, bigger than they've ever dreamed about. But God, in the process that the measure at which they've given will be pressed down, shaken together, running over into their laps, and they will discover that beautiful, beautiful thing that you do as we give. You amplify it into our lives in every area. Father, I pray that we walk out our days as people as generous. Father, that we will, in our experience of generosity, share stories that allow you to be hero and draw others to dream about your generosity in their lives and then their generosity in the lives of others. Let that be part of what we dream about. How can I give more? Who can I give more to? Because that's what you dream about doing in our lives. Father, we thank you for that. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, leaders, and what we do at C3 Church, visit our website at c3swwa.com.